Hello everyone, Dr. White back again with the third in our series of screencasts on section 5.1, estimators and the variability of them. Um, we promised to talk about the central limit theorem, which addresses the shape of the distribution of uh, some sample estimator. So remember, thinking back to that prop sampler app that we fooled around with in, in the previous screencast. When you looked at the density plot that was formed by all of those sample proportions, all those p hats, when each individual statistician took their own uh, sample, they shaped up to be roughly, you know, a bell-shaped, um, roughly a bell-shaped density plot. If you were sampling at the larger sample size, uh, I think we had n is 100 as our larger sample size. The distribution, that density plot also seemed to center around um, the population proportion. And none of that, none of that is an accident. It, it actually comes from math theorems. And the shape part, the, 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 the part about it being bell-shaped comes from what we call the central limit theorem. So let's give a, a rough statement of the central limit theorem. When you're taking a random sample, and it's truly a random sample in the sense that the items in your sample, your observations, are independent of each, of each other, okay? If the sample size is sufficiently large, if you're in sample size is sufficiently large, then that sample proportion p hat is going to tend to follow a normal distribution with expected value of p hat being p. That's the centering around the p that we saw. And the standard error of p hat being that formula we learned square root of p times 1 minus p over n. And notice there's that n on the bottom. And when n was big, you know, then um, the, when n, when n was big, the, the, uh, esti the little p hat seemed to be kind of like closer to the p. And you can see that mathematically here. When n is big in the bottom of a fraction like that, it makes the fraction smaller, so the square root smaller, so the standard error is smaller. So that all kind of fits. The key, the really important part, though, to the central limit theorem is that bit about the normal distribution. That's what's uh, really uh, what the central limit theorem is adding in that's new. What you might want you know, wonder about is this term sufficiently large, you know, sufficiently large. How large should the sample be to be sufficiently large so that you would get that, um, that normal distribution, that kind of bell shape? After all, you're not going to be usually in this situation where you can play God and be looking at the whole population and run prop sampler and, and, and watch statisticians do it and verify for yourself that the sampling distribution of p hat is approximately normal. You're going to be a statistician possessing only your one sample. So how do you know that your one sample comes from a distribution for p hat that's approximately normal? How do you know your sample size is large enough? Well, um, think back to the time that we worked with uh, the app for looking at binomial random variables and comparing them to normal curves. And uh, what we found is that when we drove up the sample, when we drove up the, the n, the number of trials, to the point where both the uh, n times p and the n times 1 minus p were both at least 10, then the binomial um, random variable started looking kind of bell-shaped. So, um, and remember the n times p was the expected number of successes in a binomial random variable and the n times one minus p was the expected number of failures. Well, um, a sample proportion is just the count of successes in your sample. 
the number of people said yes, you know, divided by the sample size. So it's very closely related to a binomial random variable. And it's going to look normal. Its sampling distribution for p hat is going to look normal in the same, under the same conditions. And so this leads to what's called the success failure condition on p hat. As long as n times p and n times 1 minus p are at least 10, then the sampling distribution for p hat is going to look approximately normal. And the bigger the sample size is, the closer it's going to look to a perfect normal curve. So it's not just like once you approach a certain big sample size, that it looks roughly normal and it kind of stays that way. No, the bigger the sample size, the closer to normal it's going to be. That's part of the central limit theorem. So just a, a reminder here of what I just said, you know, and so you can, you can do this, you can play around with binome norm yourself again, if you wish, I invite you to do that. And just watch when the binomial distribution looks normal, you'll find that under those circumstances, the n times the p that you've picked is big, and the n times 1 minus p that you've picked is big. If they're both bigger than 10, you're probably going to say to yourself, oh, yeah, yeah, it looks uh, pretty much like a normal curve. And the reason that this helps you out to figure out when the p hat sampling distribution would be about normal is that p hat is almost a binomial random variable. It's a binomial random variable on the top divided by the sample size to give you a proportion. Now, the central limit theorem doesn't just apply to sample proportions. It applies to a whole, whole bunch of estimators in statistics. Here's a more general statement of the central limit theorem. Suppose that capital X is any old random variable you like that has a finite expected value mu and a finite standard deviation sigma. So they calculate out as just you know, finite real numbers. And suppose you try that random variable n times. You know, try it, you get a value x1. Try it again, get a value x2. Try it again, get a value x3. Keep on going until you've tried it like n times. And suppose you make the sum of those values. Call it capital S. Well, capital S is another random variable. You know, it's a number that depends on chance because it depends on those x1 through xms, and they depend on chance. You know? And what do we know about it? Well, the central limit theorem tells you that that sum is going to have close to a normal distribution. Its expected value is going to be exactly n times the mean for any one of those random variables you tried. And its standard deviation is going to be the standard deviation sigma for the random variables you're trying times the square root of n. And another thing coming from the central limit theorem is that the bigger the n is, the closer to looking like a bell-shaped curve that s random variable is going to be. And so I just wanted to um, let us try that out for a sum random variable of the type that I'm thinking about. Uh, and, and we could do that with those little games that we tried out in chapter three, you know, where like you, you do a coin game or a dice game and you, you know, win or lose money based on how it, how it comes out. And, you know, you got to play the game a certain number of times. Well, the game itself you could think of as like an X1. Playing it a second time, think of it as an X2. Third time, X3. N times, Xn. And when, when you combine together your winnings and losses to get a net winning or a net loss, that's a sum. So playing those simple games lots of times is a sum random variable, a capital S, like is being talked about in, in the central limit theorem here. So let's just verify. 
let's verify that the central limit theorem really does work for these types of random variables. Let's just make a game and say that we're going to play it a certain number of times and look at our net winnings. So let's say there's a game where you flip a fair coin twice and you're going to win $40 if you get two heads. Otherwise, you're going to lose $8. What might your net winnings be if you played the game 10 times? No. The sum of your winnings and losses, that's this capital S sum variable. What might it be? What's, you know, what are likely values for it? What are unlikely values for it? What's the distribution of this sum, capital S? So what we'll do is we'll use that make game function to uh, set up a new function called game 10 that will actually let us play this little dice game 10 times and look at the net winnings. And so remember how we worked with it. We set up the little, um, we set up the little coin game. What are the possible uh, winnings and losses for one play? Well, you could win 40 or you could lose minus eight. What are the probabilities for those things? Well, there's only a one in four chance of getting two heads in your two flips. And there's a three fourth chance of not getting two heads. And you're gonna play 10 times and then combine your winnings and losses to get your sum. So let's make that game over in our studio. And I'll go ahead and uh, keep making this uh, big plot. And actually, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kill my face so it won't get in the way. And copy in the code, and there we go. So I've got game 10 here in my um, global environment. Um, let me show it to you. Global environment, show up, please. Hello. There it is. All right. So I'm going to uh, run it. Let's see. Game underscore 10. And we're just going to do it once. So um, I could say n equals 1. Uh, or I could just leave just parentheses because the default value is to play once. And I, so I'll just uh, not even put in the n equals one. And in 10 plays of that game, I lost $32. See, it says here I won negative 32 bucks. Ouch. Uh, let's try again. Up arrow. Okay, well, this time I won 64 bucks. Let's try again. Well, this time I won $16, and now it feels like it's ready to start making a little density plot of my winnings in these various tries of this sum random variable. And so, you know, here is when I lost 32 bucks. Here's when I won 64, and then here's my most recent when I, I won 16. And so I'm just going to do this for a little bit and, and watch. Uh, you know, a density curve shape up. And one thing I notice is that, you know, since it's just 10 plays, there's not a lot of possible values for the sum. And so the uh, little rug here is, um, oops. I'm sorry, I kind of blew it. Uh, I'm going to redo this. I accidentally made game 10 again. So uh, let me start it off again. Game underscore 10. Okay, there's once, twice, density curve. Okay, let's keep making that density curve. Let's make it a few times. So uh, what I'm noticing is that in 10 plays where you win 40, you lose each time, your net winnings, there's not a lot of different possible values for them. Like there's this value here and this value here and this value here and this value here. And I've done it a fair number of times. So these tick marks probably, you know, they may stand for multiple games that ended up with the same net winnings. The density plot is... Uh, 
Uh, well, it's got, you know, it's unimodal, uh, but it's not particularly bell shaped. And I can go ahead and try a lot more. When I up arrow this time, I'm going to try saying that n should be 10,000. So I'm going to add another 10,000 tries of this sum random variable. And that really clarifies things. There just aren't that many possible values. And of course, the density curve is you know, trying to be high over those possible values and practically nothing between the possible values. So it's unimodal, uh, but it's, it's right skewed and certainly doesn't look a whole lot like a normal curve. OK, uh, let's head back. And uh, what would happen if we played that game not 10 times, but 2,000 times? Then the net winnings would be the sum of 2,000 independent identical random variables. You know, each random variable is a 40, minus, or 40 or minus 8 random variable. And you'd be summing up 2,000 of them together. So let's uh, set that up. Let's make a little gain 2000 function with our make gain function. The only difference here is we're going to say plays is 2000. Okay, we grab it. Head back to our studio. Okay, we've made gain 2000. Now let's start playing it. Gain underscore 2000. Okay. Let's just play it once. I won 8,672 bucks. Up arrow. This time I won 7,600 bucks. Up arrow. I won 10,000 bucks. We're starting in on the density curve. One thing you'll notice here as you try it out once with each R command is that there's going to be a lot more different possible values for your net winning. And there I go. I blew it again. Uh, I up arrowed too much. Got to be so careful about this. Uh, make the game again. Okay, let me just make the game again. Now let's play the game again. I'm going to be careful. There we go. I'll make sure I'm running game 2000 each time in the console. Watching the distribution of that some random variable, my net winnings, watching that distribution shape up. And again, I'm getting this kind of unimodal shape. And I blew it again. Look at that. I I I start I got the code to make game 2000 again. Darn it. So I'm gonna have to start over again. You know what? This is hard. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play the game once. All right, play it again. Play it a third time. But now I'm going to just go ahead and get impatient. I'm going to play the game 10,000 times. So what this means is that I'm going to play that 40 minus 8 game 2,000 times record my results, but repeat that process 10,000 times, okay? So I'm going to get a lot of these sum random variables at once, 10,000 of them to add on to the three of them that I'm already looking at that in that density plot. So it takes a little moment. And there we are. Okay, let me try another 10,000 games to throw on to that. So another 10,000 tries of that sum random variable. So I've got like over 20,000 tries of the S random variable stuck together there. And the density plot for them is, wow, really bell-shaped, you know, really quite bell-shaped. The more plays you give yourself, the closer to bell-shaped that curve is going to be. That's the central limit theorem.
the more times you add together some random variable, the closer that's the distribution of that sum random variable is going to be to a normal curve. And that's going to back up why so many of our uh, sample estimators in statistics have a distribution that's approximately normal. Because under the hood, a lot of them are basically sums of other random variables of some sort. So that's it for our study of the central limit theorem. I'm sure we'll come back to it again and again. Uh, we can to kind of play with it, but also to uh, apply it in uh, statistical situations.